It's Legends Territory, Braun and Kratz, and thanks to the MLB PAA for setting up all of these former player interviews. For more info on your favorite former players, check out baseballalumni.com. And quick reminder, if you're watching this on YouTube, there's also the podcast version on Apple and Spotify. Just type in Legends Territory. Okay, we're about to be joined by two-time All-Star and All-Star Game MVP in 1995. Uh, 17 years in the show, he's part of both Marlins World Series titles in 1997 and 2003. The only player with both of those titles. They clean house a little bit in between uh, those two. Pretty titles. much all the time. They yeah. Do, yes. They still do that sometimes. Yes. Hence the nickname Mr. Marlin. Jeff Conine joining us right now. Jeff, how's life? And do you still embrace the Mr. Marlin title? Uh, you know, at first, uh, thanks for having me on, first off. But uh, at first, um, I thought it was kind of corny, didn't really like the nickname because they gave it to me quite a while ago. But now now I embrace it. So every time I see fans uh, walking around just uh, milling about, I go to the stadium on every home game because I'm back working with the Marlins. But at the grocery store, people just refer to me as Mr. Marlin. And, and you know what? I've come to love it. So I love that. And what describe right now exactly what you're doing with the Marlins. Do you like the current role? on where you're at because I know you've worked with them on and off for years now. Yeah, after I retired, uh, I worked for them for nine years and then there was the sale of the team. Uh, the new ownership great, uh, group came in. Uh, a lot of us were let go and now I'm back. So uh, my official title is special assistant to Bruce Sherman, the uh, principal owner of the Marlins. And um, it's been a fantastic uh, reintroduction uh, to my role and uh, it's a, it's a great ownership group. We've, uh, made a lot of progress. How different is it right now in your mind from how it's been in the past? If you can do some comparisons, cause you've basically been through every step of this franchise, whether it's been playing or being a part of the organization, like right now at this status, does it feel, I don't want to say better than ever. Cause you did win a couple titles in that early time period, but does it feel like it has more stability than ever? Well, I mean, we got, uh, you know, Lone Depot Park uh, is a beautiful place to play baseball. When you look at our shiny new stadium now and the way uh, we've got a roof. So as you know, being from Miami and spending a lot of time in Miami, a roof is a huge thing. And to play in air conditioning down here, uh, I would have loved to have done that. That's for sure. So, uh, <laughs> but, you know, as far as the evolution of the, the franchise, we've gone through uh, four owners now. And, uh, you know, it's just constant change. Uh, it's always changing everything. Uh, the rosters nowadays don't stay intact very long uh, in any organization, not just ours. So you're trying to learn and, and get used to new guys at every position every year, basically. What does that look like for you as, as a former Marlin, as a former World Series champion Marlin? How do you how do you instill that or impart that on the different facets like do you talk to the players do you talk to front office yeah that's a good question i've got um i, I say i do a lot of different things but i have no responsibility whatsoever which is uh, outstanding <laughs> uh yeah but i try to advise on on anything on player development uh trades um on the business side i'm, I'm helping out with community events and things like that so uh, I, I do uh I'm, I'm kind of bruce's sounding board as well you know he was obviously an ultra successful businessman and made his fortune in that world. Uh, and he brings me on to kind of uh, navigate those baseball situations that he might know a whole lot about. So uh, it's been great. You know, um, Bruce is very open minded to my opinion and to see a different side of things. And um, it's been a great relationship so far and uh, hopefully it'll last a long time. How would you have looked at yourself when you were a player, how would you have been like Jeff Conan? I'm about to get on the field. I'm grinding through a little quad thing. You know, I just got hit by 96 in the arm the night before. And Jeff Conan, you comes in and is like, Hey, how you feeling? How would you have dealt with yourself? Uh, I didn't like to be talked to, especially on any of those <laughs> situations. I think, uh, today's game is, is quite a bit different game than, than, uh, when I play it, I'm sure you've had a lot of guys come on, especially doing the alumni uh, that say this game is so much different than, than what we used to play. And, you know, it's uh, uh, it's hard to it's hard to be political about it and and say uh, I would I would be if I was myself. Don't talk to me. You know, I, I was 
a tough guy, I guess you'd call. And uh, unless I was bleeding from my ears, uh, leave me alone. I'm going out there to play, and I'm playing every single day. I was not one that would like to come out of the lineup ever. So is it better now? Is the game better now than when you played without? I mean, we don't need to be politically correct. You can say what you want to say. Um, no, I don't think so. I think it's um, become uh, a game. Uh, it's it's, it's lacks, lacked a lot of lacks a lot of the aggressiveness that, that we had when we played. Uh, you know, you can't take out the second baseman anymore trying to break up a double play. Uh, you can't touch the catcher when you get to home plate. Um, bigger bases now. I do love the time clock, I will say. As a defender, when you're out there and uh, you just want your pitcher to get on the mound, and, and so uh, love the time clock. I think that's been a, uh, a big uh, addition to this game. The fans have responded. They love it as well. Attendance is up this year. Um, so there, there have been some changes that I really, really like. I just wish some of the aggressiveness uh, wouldn't have been taken away from the game. Do you think your 97 or 2003 team would have won the two World Series if we were under these new rules and this style of play? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, in, in both cases, we were, we were very talented. Two different uh, teams. The 97 team was more veteran and had guys that were, you know, Dave Dombrowski was given <clears throat> a directive by our owner then, uh, Wayne Huizinga, to put a World Series team, caliber team on the field. And he went out and did it. I mean, he got Moises Salou, he got Bobby Bonilla, uh, you know, Kevin Brown. He just uh, stacked this lineup and team with veterans that knew how to play the game and play it right. And I think uh, they would would have stood the test test of time. They would they would survive in any environment. Are you surprised that Dave Dombrowski, you know, a quarter of a century later, is still getting the job done and operating? much in the same ways that he did all the way back then. In terms of his aggressiveness, he always stands out. That's one of the first words that is referred to Dombrowski. And I would say if we look at not just this past trade deadline, but off seasons in the past couple of years and last year's trade deadline, he's consistently there making moves, not sitting around. What are your thoughts on how Dombrowski has carried over into this next, you know, really century of, of MLB and also how he stands out where there's so many others that are so worried about touching any prospects. You know, yeah. Um, Dave Dombrowski to me is one of those front office um, icons that I think should be into the Hall of Fame at, at some point someday because he's taken three different organizations, uh, four different organizations, the World Series. And, um, you know, like you said, he's not afraid to make a move. He's not afraid of making a move and then what if that person doesn't work out and getting scrutiny from the, uh, from the industry. He doesn't care about that. He goes on his gut. He likes to make those moves uh, and be aggressive to improve his team then and now. Uh, yes, he's played for or he's been the, at the helm of organizations that have uh, very good resources that, that allow him to do that. But um, Man, his track record speaks for itself. He should be in the Hall of Fame someday. And I agree. You know, I, I think this, um, a lot of people in this, or in this industry won't make a move just because if it doesn't work out uh, and they get scrutiny for it from either other organizations or uh, Twitter people or their fans, uh, the, the executives that aren't afraid to go out there and put their reputations on the line and not worrying about it and just saying, hey, this is our moves. This is what we're going to do. And uh, we think it's going to work. And if it does, great. If it doesn't, also, we'll move on. Are the Marlins prepared to have success? Whether, whether they're the team they have is like, you know, the winning team, they're going to win the World Series. Are they prepared to have success? Are they moving in the direction to be a successful team that ownership says, we want to win. We want to bring in somebody that's going to build a team that wins year in and year out. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we down here have uh, some revenue challenges. Uh, we don't uh, sell out every night like a lot of northern teams do. We don't have huge TV contracts. So our revenue is much lower than most teams. So as you know, with skyrocketing salaries, we can't afford to go out there and pay the 300 plus million dollars to these superstar uh, players. So we, we have, I think right now we're in a kind of a restart, our minor league system. Uh, we got Skip Schumacher, who I think is perfect 
uh, for this organization as far as moving forward. His staff is amazing as far as being able to cultivate those young players and teach them how to play the game the right way because, you know, we don't have the luxury of having a, a three, four, five guy that uh, they all hit 30 home runs every year and, and can sit back and, and wait for that big home run late in the game. We've got to create offense. We have to manufacture runs. And I think that's the way we're building our organization now is to, to have baseball players again. You know, we, I think a lot of uh, people nowadays uh, with the, with the perfect game stuff and the, and the, the landscape of travel ball uh, focus more on tools and not how to play the actual game. Do you think that South Florida is in a better place to embrace a team that could have consistent success? I lived down there for a while, or is it too distracting and too difficult? And you know, I, I do a lot of shows with AJ Przinsky, who wants another team in Florida, in Orlando, and I'm like, dude, we got to get <laughs> Miami and Tampa Bay more consistent attendance first. Yeah, you know, you obviously you were down here. You're at UM. Uh, the South Florida market is a an event driven market. You know, if you win, they're going to come out. You know, there's a little asterisk to that. You have to win, um, no doubt about it. I don't think we're going to build that that fan base where no matter what team we throw out there, no matter what our record is, we're still going to draw. We got to win to do that. Do you see this team in the future finding core guys and signing them long term? I mean, I know you know the last time, and this led to this current team that this squad had like consistent talent that looked like it was going to be a force for a while. That was during the ownership change and guys like Giancarlo and Yelich and Azuna were traded away. Do you think if that opportunity comes about again, the team looks into signing extensions pretty early on in careers for players, because that's when you could, you know, theoretically get a better bargain, right? You always look at in the division, Ronald Acuna Jr.'s, top five player in the game, top three, whatever you want to call him. He's on an eight-year, $100 million contract. Any team can afford that. Right. And that's what we have to do. We have to get creative with those kind of deals. we got to get those players super early. Sandy, Sandy uh, Alcantara that we uh, have now, the unanimous Cy Young Award winner last year, uh, that's what the Marlins did. They locked him up for seven years. And, and that's the kind of deals that we have to do to – be successful in, in, in landing those superstar players. We're not going to go on the free agent market and, you know, sign a, a Trey Turner for $350 million. You still kind of ha have those kind of funds. And when you find that, that gem, uh, the key is to, to lock them up early so you have control for five or six years. Does Bruce look to you for those kinds of, like, discussions? Like, hey, you know, when I was coming up through, I was 25 – years old in this situation in the big leagues, I might have signed an extension. Like, does he look to you for that kind of stuff? Or is that kind of out of your scope or realm? I'm out of the money side of it. Um, I don't really, I, I'm more on the, the player themselves and, and the makeup. Um, I can definitely advise on if I think a player is the type of player that's going to fit into our system and be and have longevity just because of you know, I think a lot of people don't give enough credit to what they do in the clubhouse. You know, we've got all these metrics nowadays and we've got stats and uh, but those stats don't tell me anything about their heart and their grit and the way they play the game. And that's, I think, where I add more value is that I can evaluate a player and dig into their their past a little bit and and hopefully advise that, yeah, this is a guy you're going to be able to count on for the next five to seven years. And I will say when there are early extensions signed and they don't work out, because many of them do, often it has to do with what you're talking about oh. is, hey, I don't think this guy is going to be as motivated or, hey, I'm, I'm not loving the makeup of this guy in the clubhouse, right? He's getting into arguments with his teammates, stuff like that. So that's super important for the investment. Um, let me take you back to the early 90s where you were part of an expansion draft. What was that like for... The kids that are watching and listening out there who don't even know what that is. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, yeah, the expansion draft, uh, every team in the big leagues had to um, let leave guys under protected. So they, the first round of the playoffs, they could protect 15 players. So 25 guys on the 40-man roster were left unprotected. So the Marlins and the Rockies could go basically pluck off uh, players off rosters because they needed to fill – entire organizations, you know, they didn't have the luxury of just drafting uh, 100 players at a time. So they wanted a big league 
uh, caliber player that they could pick from every single team. And I was told like the day before that I was not protected. I thought I was going to be protected. Um, and I was told the day before I wasn't. So, you know, I went to my agent's office and we were watching uh, the draft as it happened. And, uh, you know, with the 11th pick, you know, the 11th round of the uh, expansion draft, I saw David Browski go up to that podium and he said, from the Kansas City Royals. And I don't know, I just had a pretty good feeling right then it was me. <laughs> so now I'm in the big leagues with a brand new team. Uh, we go to Melbourne, Florida. Our complex isn't even done yet. Uh, we're basically cast offs from every other organization. And I, I might have played with a few of the guys in the Meyer Leagues, but we called it the name tag spring training because, uh, you know, everyone was from somewhere else. We didn't get to play as one or as a Meyer League organization together. So it was an exciting time. It was a fun time. Uh, I don't think uh, many people realize that uh, down here in Miami, our first year, we drew over 3 million fans. And uh, we were on course to draw about 3 million the second year when we went on strike. And that kind of, uh, soured South Florida fans for, with baseball for a while. Did it feel watered down at all? Because I remember I was, I was 13 years old when the expansion draft happened, and I was, had every 13-year-old every wants to make the big leagues. And I remember somebody said, oh, well, you know, the game's just not going to be as good anymore because they're adding these teams and everything. And you know, I'm 13. That was my impression of the expansion draft. For you as a player in the absolute thick of it, did it water it down or did you hear guys like talking about it around the league? Like, oh, he wouldn't even be in the big leagues if it wasn't for the expansion draft. No, I don't, I don't remember uh, those kind of conversations. I don't remember. Uh, we had some pretty good players, even though we got plucked off of uh, other rosters. You know, Brian Harvey was our closer. Uh, we had Walt Weiss at shortstop, Dave Maggot in at third. Um, you know, uh, Arrestus Estrada had just hit 35 home runs from Japan, come over, and, and he played first base for us. So Benito Santiago behind the plate. Um, but then you look at, you know, what we did in such a short period of time. We won the World Series five years later. So, uh, like I said, a lot of kudos and credit goes to Dave Dombrowski to turn over that roster and put the pieces in place needed to win. Yeah. And uh, you can't uh, go against that track record of winning a World Series faster than any expansion team ever. How did that happen versus, you know, some of the teams that either have never won a World Series or barely get there, right? Seattle is number one. Um, they've been around longer than the Marlins. And plus, like you said, it only took five years. Those organizations have been around for decades. So what's the secret? Secret is uh, having somebody at the helm uh, that knows how to put together a team, construct a team, and then luck. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, you got these $300 million payrolls that have all-stars at every position. But as we were talking about before, if that clubhouse doesn't gel, if that uh, camaraderie and that, uh, that culture doesn't come together, it doesn't matter who you got on the field, I think. Um, so we had uh, two World Series teams in Florida. Both those teams played like a family. And, you know, like during the course of a 162 game season, you need some luck. You need guys to stay healthy. We had, you know, five, six guys play over 150 games on both those teams. So when you've got that core group of uh, middle of the lineup guys that can stay out on the field for 150 games and you've got a healthy pitching staff and a healthy bullpen, I mean, you're going to do great things. And I think, you know, what Dave did, uh, he did that culture. He, he, he prescribed to that culture mentality and put together a bunch of guys that really uh, played well together. I mean, family. We went out to dinner all the time. We did things together. Um, same with the 2003 team. I always said that the 2003 team was the most fun I've ever had on a baseball field because it was more unproven yet ultra-talented guys, and we just all came together. We had a blast every single day we came to the ballpark, and I don't think we ever felt like we were out of the game no matter what the series score was. Who? Who made that happen? Who, like, I know I talked to Juan Pierre about the 2003 team. He said in the playoffs, he's like, we played the game. He's like, I didn't even want to leave the park. He's like, I just want, like, I showed up the next day super early and, like, everyone was just hanging out. Like, I, he didn't want the season to end. So who, because it's two different teams. You even came, you were there for the 97, left and came back. You know, did you, did you feel like, I, I have so many questions about, because you just keep saying clubhouse, clubhouse, clubhouse. And we talk about this all the time on this show, how it matters. You can have all the talent in the world, but if you do not come together, and it doesn't need to be friends, but you got to be able to come together. Who put that together as such a 
small, like nobody came up through the minor leagues together. So you couldn't have that. So who on those teams was that glue? Um, you know, it's, it's hard to say that there was, you could point to one person or one uh, entity other than who put the team together. You know, the general managers, uh, Larry Beinfest for 2003 and Dave Dombrowski for 1997. I mean, uh, and I don't even know if they delve that far into personalities of each player saying, hey, we got to get this guy because he's a good clubhouse guy. I think there's a lot of luck involved. Um, and as far as 2003, we had uber talented guys that just were baseball players. You know, they, they knew how to win a baseball game. And, you know, you go around that infield with uh, Derek Lee and Luis Castillo and Alex Gonzalez and, and Mike Lowell at third and, and then a 20 year old Miguel Cabrera as well. Uh, that was the best defensive infield I've ever seen, ever played behind. Uh, I was out in the outfield and left field with Juan Pierre and, and center and Juan Encarnacion out in right. And we, we just had a solid, solid baseball team that guys knew their roles. They knew how to win. They knew what to do in every situation to help the team win, uh, which I think is is lost a little bit in today's game. Uh, you know, they don't uh, they're not taught that from a young age. We were taught how to move runners over. We were taught. Uh, to hit and run. We were t when was the last time you saw a pitch out or a hit and run? I mean, it just doesn't happen anymore uh, because no one focuses on it. We were all baseball players and uh, we all came together. And, you know, you go back to, to 90 or I'm mean, sorry, 2003. And, you know, like I said, we had a 2000 or a 20 year old Miguel Cabrera. We had a 20 year old or 21 year old Dontrell Willis who were taking this league by storm and they just didn't care. They're baseball players. They got out there. Uh, they didn't to come to pressure. They didn't care about pressure. They wanted to play baseball because they were baseball players, even in the playoffs. You know, Miguel Cabrera is strolling the outfield in, in Yankee Stadium, the hallowed ground of Yankee Stadium to play a World Series game. And it looks like for him, it's a Tuesday against the Expos. That's how he that's how he took care of it. And uh, it showed because uh, he became one of the greatest players this game's ever seen. So do you think that South Florida baseball and Marlin fandom in general would have been different if, say, Miggy stayed. And we'll get into the you know, fire sale in general, but just starting with, you know, one of the legendary ball players at the start of his career, winning them a World Series and who knows, could have won them more and had that whole career that we just saw right there in Miami. You know, uh, yeah, of course, uh, you want a guy like that on your team with uh, 30 and 100 every single year, batting 300 plus. Um, but I will say, you know, everyone says fire sales. Yes, 97 after that was a complete fire sale. Uh, the team was absolutely gutted. They lost 108 games, I think, the next year. Uh, but ownership in 2003, yeah, we moved pieces around, um, but we put really quality teams on 2004 and 2005. Um, but that injury bug got us. Uh, we didn't have the personnel play as many games as we did. Jack McKean was still our manager. So we had legitimate shots to go back out there 2004 and 2005 uh, to get back to the playoffs. And then things changed in 2006. But, um, you know, we had really good teams in, in 04 and 05. In 97, did you feel like unloved or did the players feel that way where you're like, what else could we do here? And it was such an uncharacteristic situation, even for back then, where suddenly the whole team is disbanded after winning a World Series. Did people understand the financial components? Well, that's just it. You know, uh, baseball is a business, and Wayne Izinga put out $95 million of his money to make money. That's, that's what he does. He's a businessman. So uh, from my understanding, it was, uh, hey, attendance after 94 had waned quite a bit. 95, 96 was ticking up a little bit. He gave the directive to Dave Dombrowski. He says, hey, Go out there and build me a World Series winning team or World Series caliber team. And I want to see if South Florida is going to support this team. And yes, there was an uptick in, 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 in attendance for 97 just because we were so good. We had such a good record. Um, but, you know, we didn't even sell it the first round of the playoffs. Uh, you know, they kept those tarps up in the upper levels of pro player stadium. And they would, um, I remember running out to my position one game and the first game, there was another tarp up there in the left corner way up high. And I'm like, wait, that wasn't there before. I'm like, oh, they couldn't sell those seats, so they covered them up. Um, then, of course, you know, we win the first round of the playoffs. Second round, they start peeling the World Series. Uh, we've got 67,000 in the house. and That's that's Miami. I mean, that's it's an event-driven town. They're going to come out to see a big event. And sure enough, uh, they supported big time in those playoffs. But 
Wayne Heisinga said this uh, amount of attendance wasn't enough for me to make money and to make it a successful, successful business venture for me. So he sold. Do you feel like then the next year in 98, when McGuire and Sosa took over the league, do you feel like they rescued the sport back as a whole to an upper echelon in terms of revenue, popularity, everything else? And of course, carrying that into like, do you think guys like that should still be recognized and be Hall of Famers? Like we had Big Mac on recently, who obviously is like, dude, I, he, he literally said, I put the sport on my back during that time period and we knew what was going on. No doubt. No doubt. Him and uh, Sosa, that, that captivated America, you know, not only baseball fans, but everybody. And I think that pulled baseball out of that doldrum, that hangover from the 94 strike and uh, put it back on the map. And, and a lot of people became fans again. And uh, it's, it's crazy to think that two players did that uh, by themselves, pretty much with that race they had. But, you know, uh, even us baseball players were captivated every single night. You know, we'd, we'd look at the scoreboard and wait for to see who's hit the next home run or check the box score the next morning to see who hit the next home run. And, and we were fans as well. Uh, it was a very exciting summer. Now you weren't there when he w when the change was made, but Jack McKeon came in in 2003 partway through the season. Do you feel like when teams make those changes, it's kind of a last-ditch effort? Because you bring in an entirely new staff. I remember Doug Davis was your bench coach. Doug Davis had spent like six minutes in the in the big leagues as a backup catcher, like, and you guys go on to win the World Series. Do you feel like that move, and obviously you were listening to your teammates who played, do you feel like that move kind of ruined it for everyone else who fires a manager partway through the year and expects to win a World Series? Uh, it's, that, it's that culture thing again. Jack was the kind of guy that uh, he threw his eight guys out there every single day. Um, He'd get the, the bench guys in occasionally just to keep them semi-sharp. But he, he had his guys, and he's like, you know what? Check your egos at the door. That was his big saying. Check your egos at the door and go out there and have fun. And that's what we did. Uh, we embraced that. When Jack took over, the Marlins were uh, 10 games under 500, And from that point of the season to the end, we had the best record in baseball. So um, we really embraced Jack and the way his – you know, he made some crazy moves. Uh, Jack would have a gut feeling about something. He'd put – uh, a, a reliever into bunt or a re reliever into pinch hit and it would work. It was like, you know, we had, uh, we said that Jack had the golden horseshoe, you know, where, and uh, every move that he made worked out and we rode that to the very end. And, uh, you know, it was an exciting, I think that's, that's one of the reasons we had so much fun was that Jack let us be us and he let us play us. And I think he let that clubhouse manage itself and it became this uh, group of guys that just had a common goal of, of winning it all. And uh, we made it happen. I want to ask you then about spinning forward to your time with the Marlins. Um, I know you mentioned earlier in the conversation, you had time off from the team. Um, what happened there with, I guess, your relationship with Derek Jeter? Did you have a lot of conversations with him about kind of, you know, keeping the longevity with the team. You're really the only guy, like we mentioned earlier, that has been with this franchise through thick and thin from start to finish. And there's been a lot of chapters. Yeah, a lot of chapters. Um, uh, basically had just a couple sentences of conversation with Derek. Uh, our team president at the time, David Sampson, uh, was the one to tell us the news that we were no longer um, employed. Uh, that was me. Uh, Andre Dawson, Tony Perez, Jack McKeon, uh, we were all special advisors and we were all let go. So, um, you know, you can say what you want about change and, and, uh, and, and changing things up. And they did that. They, the newer, the new uh, ownership group came in and they wanted a clean slate. So they basically got rid of everybody that was associated with uh, the previous regime and, and started from scratch. What was your relationship like with Samson and with Loria back then? Did you feel like at any point, you know, especially Loria, who actually owned the team, was misunderstood? Because, I mean, he went from the Montreal situation down to the Marlins. You, you guys won with him. So um, did you have a good working relationship with them and have, you know, an impact on what they were doing um, up until they sold? Yeah, uh, I had a great relationship with both uh, Jeffrey and David. Um, you know, they're they're passionate baseball people. Jeffrey was a passionate; he was a baseball fan first and foremost. 
Uh, he was blessed to have a phenomenal career in the art business and gave him the uh, opportunity to own a baseball team. And, and he was a fan, man. He wanted to win. He never missed a pitch. I don't care where he was. He'd be in France uh, doing an art deal, but he's got uh, the Marlins game on. And, and uh, you know, he did whatever he could at any time to improve the team. And he gave uh, David that leeway to try and uh, improve the team whenever he could. And, you know, like I said before, Miami and the market of the Marlins have always had financial constraints of, of what you can spend. And I think uh, Jeffrey even overspended uh, his limits just because he was so passionate about trying to put a winner on the field. It's no secret there's some owners in the game, like obviously in Oakland right now, there's a lot of scrutiny on what's gone on there. I've always been trying to think of a way for owners to connect more with the properties that they own in our sport. And some of them do a fantastic job. And like you said, to me, just hearing that an owner loves the game, he's at the games, like that is step one in terms of hoping that your franchise will connect with the fan base and understand what it's like, right? There's some owners and we've talked to some players where they've never showed up. Do you think that there's anything we can do? Like, obviously you can't tell an owner what to do with his team, but maybe the commissioner's office is like, hey, you have to go to at least 20 home games just so you can experience what you run. Because real talk, you know, there's at least probably five to seven owners that don't get to more than you know one or two ball games, and I'm just like, dude, you own the team. You have to understand what this game is like. Well, when you think about owners, um, and, and I'm sure it's a small group, but uh, some owners, baseball is not their main business. Uh, they are super busy running their their other uh, entities and businesses that take a majority of their time. And uh, you know, I will say, Bruce Sherman is is not one of those guys. He uh, is at a lot of games. He's also uh, on whatever media he can get onto to watch every pitch of every game. He's always following me, texting me all the time about uh, games and how exciting it was if won or what happened in this loss or something like that. So he is very engaged. Um, but at the same time, you know, they have uh, other things to take care of. And, and what made their fortunes was not baseball. Uh, so they're, I, I give them a little leeway saying that, uh, you know, their main uh, life business is is not baseball, and they need time to, to run that. So they can't always get uh, to a baseball game. But baseball fans think they should be always cheering for the team, just like they're always cheering for the team and never missing it. My 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 Marlins like iconic moments might not be the same as yours. Obviously, base hit up the middle, the win, the win the World Series, there's plays, you know, Craig Council running home, all this stuff. To me, the two that stick out in my mind, I'll go to the first one, is Eric Gregg and the, maybe he was missing the K-zone a little bit. Maybe we needed the box on the screen. Talk to us about that game and how that was. This is number two on my list, so we'll get to number one after this. But how is this, you know, being, being an active player in that game? Uh, that was the craziest maybe game I've ever been a part of as far as uh, balls and strikes were concerned. You know, LeVon Hernandez, who, yeah, he was a great pitcher and uh, a stud, but uh, he struck out 15 that night. Um, and Greg Maddox struck out nine. So we had 24 Ks uh, in that game in, in the hole. But you're talking about Greg Maddox, who might have been the, the greatest uh dart throwing pitcher of all time. Like if you're going to give him six inches off the plate, that guy's going to be able to hit that six inches every single time. Well, that night it might've been a foot off the plate and he was able to hit that pitch, that spot every single time. So me as a hitter, I'm like, I have no chance of hitting that. So I'm trying to, I crowded the plate, which I didn't move around a lot in the box uh, as far as to counteract what a pitcher was trying to do. So I would, I mean, I was right on top of the box and some of these pitches I couldn't hit with a fungo, you know, a 37 inch fungo. It was crazy. Um, but it was for both ways, you know, it was for both sides. It was a two to one game. We ended up winning. And, uh, if you don't remember the last pitch of the game, it was Fred McGriff was up there and, and Levon threw a curveball, and Charles Johnson received it. And he stood up to throw the ball back to Levon cause he was a ball and Eric Greek punched him out. And, uh, sure enough, here we go. We piled on each other. It was kind of a delayed situation cause we all knew it was a ball too, but uh, he called a strike. We all celebrate, and it's probably the the only time in postseason history that a an umpire was part of the postseason or the uh, post game press conference. How soon did you guys realize? How soon did you guys realize how bad the zone was, even for both teams? 
Well, I mean, you know, God rest his soul, Eric Gregg's no longer with us, but when you knew, when Eric Gregg was behind the plate, you knew it was going to be a wide zone, regardless of what the game was. Uh, we had him uh, for a game out in L.A. Ramon Martinez was on the mound. Uh, Mike Piazza behind the plate, and he threw a no-hitter that night. Uh, he threw 112 pitches. He threw 100 fastballs. Uh, Piazza was set up about a foot off the plate, and he just kept on darting that thing. And when you got up on the plate to try to catch that 100-mile-an-hour or that 95-mile-an-hour fastball eight inches off the plate, he'd bust you in and blow your bat up. So uh, you know the umpires back then especially had – uh, reputations of being pitchers umpires or hitters umpires and you knew what to expect uh, when you saw that lineup card you knew <laughs> who was behind home plate what was going to what it was going to be like last night that night as a, as a hitter all right so we'll go to my number one you refute it you tell me if it's not number one you throwing out jt snow to pudge rodriguez to end the game i mean that's uh other than the actual pylons at the end of the World Series, when we won, we know we won, it's all over. That was probably the high, uh, baseball career as far as one single play and how it evolved and uh, the impact it had. I think, uh, I think from what I know, it's the only postseason series to end with a play at the plate still to this day in uh, the history of baseball. So uh, the magnitude of that was, was pretty big. And uh, it was just a, a crazy play the way it developed. Um, you know, we got a tying run on second base. Uh, Jeffrey Hamm is at the plate. He takes a pretty big swing for me. So I'm, I'm reading the swing, and it looked like he should have hit the ball much harder than he did, but he got off the end. So I kind of took a step back a little bit, and I realized, nope, he got off the end. So I'm, I feel like I'm running for like a minute. You know, I'm running, 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 and it's amazing what goes through your mind in such a short period of time. It's like, all right, do I die for this ball? I got to catch this ball. This is the end of the game. I mean, we're going to win if I catch this ball. And I'm like, I don't think I'm going to get there. I, I, I can't die for it because if I dive and it gets away from me, then that ball is going to squirt out to the side. He's going to score. The guy's going to get to second base. I mean, this is all going through my mind in like 30 feet, 40 feet, however many feet it was. Um, so I decide, no, nope, I'm just going to try to play it on the short hop. And I think he's going to score easily. Uh, just the way in my mind how long this play was taking to develop. So Kind of checked up on the side. I, I came up to the side and I got it and I made the transfer and I got to about right here to throw it and I saw where JT Snow was. And I'm like, holy crap. And I let it go and I saw the trajectory and I knew it was going to be a one hopper. It was a little offline, but I saw where JT Snow was and I'm like, oh my God, I think we got him. I think there's going to be a collision. And then it seemed like everything went in slow motion from there on. And I'm holding my breath and I see Pudge grab the ball and then he stepped into the lane. And JT Snow smacks him, and then he holds that ball up, you know, and everybody's piling on top of him, and then it kind of went back to normal speed, and we started going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so one more for me from the memory bank. Do you thank Alex Gonzalez for your World Series like Pudge Rodriguez says he does? Um, you know, Bartman gets a lot of the attention, but there were players on the field that were not having their best days. Yeah, Bartman, uh, yeah, that was the catalyst that kind of, I think, lit the spark uh, under us. Uh, you know, we go through that at bat, Luis Castillo hits that ball down the line, and I'm, like, right at the end of the dugout, so I'm watching it come down, and I see a Lou over there camped, and I'm like, damn, you know, that's going to be, that's that's an out, and that would have been the second out of the inning in the eighth. Uh, and then you see a guy's hand kind of go over and it disrupt the ball, and I'm like, oh, my God, what just happened? So I thought they were going to call interference. I really did. Uh, but there was no call made, and our dugout went crazy, and guys started screaming, let's make him famous, boys. Let's make him famous. <laughs> and then, uh, like you said, uh, he ends up walking or getting on base. The next play, Miguel hits that uh, two-hopper to shortstop. Gonzalez, who won the gold glove that year at shortstop, clanks it, and everybody's safe. And then, like, 12 minutes later, we had scored eight runs, and we're now leading game six, uh, eight to three. It was uh, – most insane inning that I've ever been a part of. Is it crazy to you how much that has carried over to 2023 now where, you know, one fan's name and one situation there is still like so big and the Cubs even since then have won a world series yet still, whether you know, everyone knows who he is, it's been a long time. Yeah. We didn't make him infamous. We made him famous. And uh, <laughs> I think there was a, there was a guy, a mayor, I think in Vero beach uh, offered him, 
uh, sanctuary for like three months free rent at some resort just to get him out of Chicago because he knew he was never going to be able to show his face there again. And that, that goes to show the, the passionate Cubs fans, and they had not had a World Series uh, in like 108 years uh, at that point, and they were so desperate to get in there, and they were up 3-1 to one on the lowly Marlins. You know, everybody thought of us as just a, a low-lying team, and, and we played in a football stadium in South Florida, um, and they thought they were just going to steamroll over us and, and get on to the World Series. But uh, my goodness, uh, that poor guy, his life was forever changed. And uh, you ask any person, I don't, even think, I don't care if they're a baseball fan, uh, to name maybe their top three most villainous hated people, Bartman's going to be one of them. Yeah, it is freaking crazy how long it's been, and that still carries. Twenty years, uh, twenty years yeah. ago, he's still. The only other name I can think of like that is like, but this was on the positive end, like Jeffrey Mayer in that game with the Yanks and Orioles made yeah, the catch, but, but not no, as not as not much. The, the one the one that I thought of was you know, Mookie rolls over. And the third, no, threw his legs right, back. Right, threw Buckner, misses. but that, but that's a player on it's the field. It's a player, but like about a fan. They made, they like said in, the, in the dugout, let's make him famous. They didn't say let's make Alex Gonzalez famous. He already was. Let's make Steve Bartman famous. It just blows my mind. Yeah. Uh, and you know what? Really if cool. you were sitting there and I was sitting there, we probably would have done the same thing. The ball's right there. What does every fan want to do? They want to catch a. They want to catch a ball. Oh, and yeah. he didn't really probably even realize that he was in the field of play. He just wanted to catch that ball and. Unfortunately, he was in that seat. If the guy next to him, if it was one seat over, that guy probably would have done the exact same thing. So uh, it was just unlucky. Wrong place, wrong time, for sure. Yeah, yeah. also the awareness of, of just if there's a baseball in the air, you don't know as a fan like exactly where it's going to land. You it's like Google. Fans. It's like Uber. You know, it's like uh, uh, there's he's got a, he's in forever emblazoned in our in our culture. Yeah, it's a verb. Like you, you, you Bartman that play, right? <laughs> you, you reached out, you interfered. So, well, we'll end it on that, Jeff. Awesome talking to you. Appreciate it. And also, just for everyone watching and listening, for more info on your favorite former players, hit up baseballalumni.com. Thanks to the MLBPAA for setting this all up. And great to talk to you, Jeff. Likewise, guys. Appreciate being on.